So mental health disorders affect up to one in five adults in the United States and contribute substantially to the worldwide morbidity and mortality. The lives of individuals with mental disorders are cut short by 10 years on average. This is by Walker, 2015. So hi, I'm Charlotte Frasa, a third year PhD student in computational neuroscience. And today I want to talk about computational psychiatry because currently I'm working on some projects in computational psychiatry and I want to introduce this topic to you such that you may work in it yourself, research it a bit more yourself. And I want to give you the tools, tips, techniques and tricks to learn more about this field. So first of all, what is computational psychiatry? So computational psychiatry is an interdisciplinary field that uses computational methods and models to understand the underlying mechanisms of mental disorders and to develop new treatments for these disorders. This field combines the techniques from computer science, mathematics and engineering with the knowledge from neuroscience and psychiatry to create mathematical models of the brain and behavior. These models can be used to simulate brain activity, test hypotheses about the causes of mental disorders and predict the effect of different treatments. The goal of computational psychiatry is to gain a deeper insight in the understanding of the biological, physiological and environmental factors that contribute to mental disorders and to use this understanding to develop more effective and personalized treatments. So a big difference between computational neuroscience and computational psychiatry is then the emphasis on the patients and the clinicians. So instead of just wanting to create computational models that pertain to the mean of the distribution, we really want to understand the effects for people that are lying more on the edges of the distribution. So what you can imagine is just like when you have cancer, for example, and you go to the doctor and your oncologist might monitor tumor markers to dynamically optimize chemotherapy. A psychiatrist might monitor your brain connectivity changes to rapidly optimize an antidepressant regime, for example, if you're struggling with antidepressants and currently this type of personalized medicine that's really specified for the individual is not yet available but this is really a goal that computational psychiatry wants to achieve because we have such rich knowledge in neuroscience and also data from neuroimaging that could potentially help several people that are struggling with their mental health. So I want to tell you a little bit about where we are now, where we're going and how you could contribute if you're interested in this field. So chapter one is about where we currently are. So at the moment the DSM-5 is one of the most well-known manuals to diagnose several patients with their mental disorders. So the DSM-5 is the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders. However, ever since the DSM-5 has been introduced to the field, or ever since the DSM has been introduced to the field, there have been a lot of controversies surrounding the DSM. So for example, strikingly, according to the DSM definition, it is possible for two people to receive the same diagnosis of a major depressive disorder without sharing a single symptom. One MDD patient may experience a depressed mood, weight gain, constant tiredness and fatigue and regularly think about ending their lives, whereas another MDD patient may experience anhedonia, loss of weight and go through psychomotor and concentration difficulties. So you can see that the same diagnosis can be given to several patients without them having any of the same symptoms. And the same thing is with the causes. So people can have the same causes, we think, biologically without receiving the same diagnosis from their psychiatrist. And this has led to quite a controversy, what exactly these diagnoses mean, why there is such a difference between several psychiatrists when they diagnose the same patient, is there any like underlying value? And these kind of problems have been present in the field of psychiatry since the beginning. And for example, one quote that I really think shows this problem quite nicely is from John Ronson, the psychopath test a journey through the madness industry. So he says about the DSM, I bought the book and leafed through it. I closed the manual. I wonder if I've got any of the 374 mental disorders, I thought. I opened the manual again and instantly diagnosed myself at at least 12 different ones. And this is also something that's quite common that people that in general feel they don't have necessarily a mental disorder or they're not struggling in life necessarily, but they could be according 
according to the DSM-5, diagnosed with several <laughs> mental disorders. So, and in general, psychiatrists, of course, are aware of these problems. This is not something new that I'm introducing here for the first time. But the fact is that the DSM-5 is usually quite a useful tool to start understanding a patient and explain to them what they are perhaps could be struggling with. But one of the goals of computational psychiatry is that they want to have a more fundamental, in a sense of a biological explanation that kind of converges to more clear, distinct categories. So that brings us to chapter two, where we are going. So in general, the goals of computational psychiatry. So one of the main goals of computational psychiatry is to find biological, so grounded in neuroscience or genetic, relevant labels, or to find labels that could prove to be clinically useful, such that we can know for which patient, for example, which type of medicine would work better based on their genetics, environment, or brain signature. And to reach this type of goal, we really want to bring the knowledge from computational neuroscience back into the clinic. And one major shift that has to be made within the field of computational neuroscience to allow for this knowledge to go towards computational psychiatry is that it needs to be individualized. Because a lot of computational neuroscience trials and also research has been done between two populations. So usually we compare a population of relatively healthy individuals and a population of individuals that might be struggling. And then we look at the means of these two populations and see if these differ. But you can imagine that within these populations there is a large amount of variability and heterogeneity. So for example, a healthy individual in population number A could still be struggling with certain symptoms of depression, whereas for example a patient that is diagnosed with depression but relatively well functioning could be actually quite similar to the healthy population. The fact is that within patients that have been diagnosed with mental disorders there is a high heterogeneity but also within the healthy population so we don't really want to compare these two populations with each other we would actually want to understand for each individual person how their mental health looks like biologically genetically and also how it is expressed in their environment. So, so that brings us to chapter three, what kind of models are being currently used in computational psychiatry and how can you learn more about them? So I really want to give you here like the resources, the tools, tell you a little bit about the data that you could find or use such that if you're interested in this field, you could kind of start learning about it more from scratch using these materials. So as I said, for computational psychiatry, almost the same type of models are being used as in computational neuroscience, but they're really being specified for individual participants and we also want to know a little bit more usually about the causal mechanisms that cause these mental disorders. So three types of models are commonly used and that's reinforcement models, Bayesian models and also neural networks nowadays are quite popular. So in reinforcement learning models, so reinforcement learning is a research field that lays at the intersection between mathematical psychology, artificial intelligence and control theory. It addresses how systems of any sort, be they artificial or natural, can learn to gain rewards and avoid punishments in what might be very complicated environments involving states such as locations in a maze and transitions between states. So they describe how an agent should behave under some explicit notion of what that agent is trying to optimize. And in that sense, they offer a normative framework to understand behavior. So we kind of can understand if an agent or a patient or a participant would act in the most optimal way, how would this participant act? And if they deviate from that, we can perhaps understand a little bit more the causal mechanisms of how they deviate or why they deviate. Another model that's quite popular, the Bayesian model. So the Bayesian model is a prominent idea in modern computational neuroscience, and that is that the brain maintains and updates internal probabilistic models of the world that serve to interpret the environment and guide our actions. In doing so, it uses calculations akin to the well-known statistical models of Bayesian inference. So when applied to psychiatry, this approach conceptualizes mental illness as the brain trying to interpret the world through a distorted internal probabilistic models or incorrectly combining such internal models with sensory information generating maladaptive beliefs. So within 
Bayesian theory, you kind of have your priors and your likelihood. And there is this idea that there is a wrong or a misalignment in how you update these to make a prediction about your environment for certain mental disorders. And the last one is a neural network model. So for example, there's this paper from Nature that is deep neural network models in psychiatry. And right now, deep neural network models are used to, for example, train on neuroimaging data. Then you can make these convolution, non-linearity, and also pooling. You can and combine everything into one deep neural network architecture and then for example make a prediction if someone would be a patient or if someone would be healthy according to their brain physiology. So these are some examples of the type of models that are being used. So if you want to learn a little bit more about how to use these models I would for example follow kind of the same pipeline as I explained in my how to learn computational neuroscience from scratch and that's just to first learn Python then do machine learning course for example on Coursera and afterwards find a project to apply this to. So the second thing I want to talk a little bit about is the types of data you can use in these kind of models. So there are different types of data that you could use. So one thing that's really hot and coming is to use mobile phone data. So you can really track every day how a participant moves through space, also their typing speed, for example, or what kind of websites they go to. Another big data set is neuroimaging data, genetics, behavior, and lastly, also, for example, your circadian rhythms or your sleep and wakefulness cycles could be indicative of um, certain psychiatric disorders being present. So then at chapter four, I kind of want to talk about the tools you could use to learn about it. So as I said before, computational psychiatry is a really new field. So there have been some books written about it over the last few years, but I would mainly look at papers. So I want to give you a list of a few papers that I would recommend you start reading if you've never heard about computational psychiatry before. So I made a list of five computational psychiatry papers that you could start reading. So they go over different models that I explain before so reinforcement models Bayesian learning and also deep neural network models and I think if you read these papers you will have a really good understanding of where the field is currently at and which gaps are still present so the first one is computational psychiatry and the second one is from reinforcement learning models to psychiatry and neurological disorders the third one is computational psychiatry as a bridge from neuroscience to clinical applications the fourth one is beyond lumping and splitting a review of computational approaches for stratifying psychiatry disorders and I find this one really interesting because it really pertains to individual predictions for patients and participants and the fifth one is realizing the potential of mobile mental health new methods for new data in psychiatry so this last one is really about how to use mobile phone data to make um, mobile phone footprints for individual participants which I find a really interesting method of course so um, some books that I would recommend. So I've used for this video Computational Psychiatry, a primer. It's written by a lot of researchers that are currently working on the field. So it's a combination of some papers that have been written on the field. So I think that's also a really good tool. Something else that I would definitely recommend if you're gonna start in Computational Psychiatry is also to learn a little bit about the history and the use of language in psychiatry because the diagnosis of mental disorders is still to this day quite controversial and it definitely changes throughout the years what kind of behavioral patterns are considered as psychiatric disorders and what's considered normal within the population and I think you need to be quite sensitive of your language if you want to work in this field so even I probably in five years this video will be quite outdated of what we think mental disorders are so the difference between the right word and the almost right word is the difference between lightning and the lightning bug and that's by Mark Twain. So if you're interested in the language and also society and mental disorders, I would definitely recommend reading Michael Foucault, so Madness and Civilization. So Michael Foucault's thoughts on mental health are quite complex and nuanced, but he argued in general that the concept of mental illness is mostly a social contract that is used to control and discipline individuals, so quite controversial. And also a book that I would recommend uh, is this one, The Divide Itself, also quite controversial, but The Divide Itself is an existential study in sanity and madness. And it's a book by the British psychiatrist and author Lang. So the book explores the idea 
that mental illness is not purely a medical condition, but rather a reaction to the stresses and conflicts of living in a society that is at odds with one's sense of self. So I think this is still really a hotly debated topic, how much mental health is your environment, how much it's genetics, how much it's brain patterns, or how much it's actually just society condemning certain individuals to behave a certain way. So I definitely think this is an interesting debate that you should follow a little bit if you're interested in computational psychiatry. Um, a course that I would definitely follow if you're interested in computational psychiatry is the computational psychiatry course in Zurich. It's amazing. All their videos are online. Every year they hold it in the summer. So if you're a master's student or a PhD student in the field of neuroscience, you can definitely apply and attend it live. But also all the lectures are recorded so if you don't have the resources or the ability to travel to Switzerland you can also watch everything online and I think they've done it for a couple of years so there's definitely enough material to deep dive into. So the final question if you made it to the end of this video which I would be really curious about is do you think throwing equations at mental illnesses could be useful or do you think this is a field that should not exist? I would love to actually hear some different opinions on this field because I do think some of the things that are being done are a little bit controversial. And with that, I also want to leave you with a final quote from Foucault's book on madness and civilization. And that is on the conversation with mental disorders. In the serene world of mental illness, modern man no longer communicates with the madman. On one hand, the man of reason delegates the physician to madness, thereby authorizing a relation only through the abstract universality of disease. On the other, the man of madness communicates with society only by the intermediary of an equally abstract reason which is order, physical and moral constraint. The anonymous pressure of the group the requirements of conformity. So this was a little introduction in computational psychiatry. I hope you found it interesting and see you next week. Bye!